Chapter 17, The Nature of Stars. In this chapter, you're going to learn how astronomers figure out what they know in terms of the stars. So, for example, there's one billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy alone. How do astronomers know how far away these stars are in our Milky Way galaxy? How do they know how bright they are? How much energy is coming out of them? And how do astronomers determine the size of these stars? Do we take a really big ruler out of the star? So this chapter explores how astronomers figure out all the properties of stars. So to start off, if we just looked at how bright a star is, it wouldn't be a very good indicator of distance. Instead, astronomers use a technique called stellar parallax to determine the distance to nearby stars. Now, by nearby, we mean stars within about 100 parsecs or so. so still pretty far away. So parallax is the apparent displacement of an object because of a change in the observer's point of view. So in this image here, we have an observer at position A looking at the tree. And at that position A, the tree looks like it's in front of the mountain there on the right. But if you're in position B and you're looking at that same tree, that tree appears to be in front of the mountain on the left. So there's an apparent displacement of where the object appears to be based on the observer's viewpoint. So that angle between the two mountains could be measured and that could help astronomers determine how far away that tree really is. Okay, so in terms of stars, instead of having two observers, one on this side and one on the other side, astronomers use the position of the orbit of the Earth around the sun. So if we look at a nearby star here in the center, and we view this star in July, okay? And we wait six months, right? Halfway around our year's orbit around the sun of 12 months. So we go six months around and we observe that same star again in January. We look at where that star is relative to the background stars. So in July, the star appeared to be relative in this position to the stars. In January, the star appeared over here. So there's an angular displacement here. Half of that angle we label as P, the parallax angle. And from that parallax angle, we are able to determine the distance to that star from our own sun. And that's because the distance in parsecs is equal to 1 over the parallax angle in arc seconds. Now, notice that the farther the star is away from the sun, the smaller this parallax angle will be. The closer the star is, like in this example, the larger that parallax angle will be. So calculating this, as I mentioned, the distance of the star is equal to 1 over that angular displacement, that parallax, as measured in arc seconds. So this is the easiest way for astronomers to determine distance to stars. So recall that one parsec is about 3.26 light years, or that's about 3 times 10 to the 13 kilometers, or about 206 astronomical units. So Proxima Centauri has the largest parallax angle. It has a parallax angle of like 0.27 arc seconds. So therefore, Proxima Centauri is the closest star to our own sun. So Parallax is really useful for stars that are close enough, right? If they get too far away, that parallax angle gets too tiny, and we have trouble figuring out how far away those stars are. So to, to look at the distance to really far away stars, we'll be using properties of stars like the brightness and the luminosity, but you'll only be able to understand that once we figure out how we determine those properties. So going back to parallax, there's an easy way for you to experience parallax. Try putting your thumb right in front of your face, like around your nose, and you're going to look between one eye and the other. Now notice that your eyes are spaced out by a distance. So close your left eye and look at your thumb. Now close, open your right eye and close, sorry, so close your left eye and look through your right eye at your thumb. Now close your right eye and look through your left eye at your thumb. Do this back and forth, and what happens to your thumb? you'll notice that your thumb appears to jump back and forth because you're looking at your thumb 
through different positions, just like those two people looking at the tree. So you're seeing a parallax angle jump of your thumb in front of your face. Now, if you take your thumb and put it out at arm's length and do the same thing, you'll notice that the angular jump of your thumb from eye to eye is a lot smaller. So that's, your thumb is a star. So the closer to your eyes, which your eyes are representing the earth around the sun, the closer they are, the bigger the parallax angle jump. And the farther your thumb is, the farther the star, the smaller that parallax angle jump. Okay, so just a reminder, I said, you know, a parsec, okay, is a distance at one arc second, one, sorry, one astronomical unit um, maps out an angle of one arc second, right? So that gives you a length of a parsec. So if we know the distance, Okay, from parallax. Then we can determine the luminosity of a star. So let's talk about brightness. So how bright a star appears to be in the night sky. So often we just call that brightness. Now luminosity, on the other hand, is intrinsic brightness or absolute brightness. It's the amount of energy emitted from the star each second per square meter. So it's the total light output. So how much energy is actually coming out of the star? So it's important to recognize that when we talk about brightness, the greater we get, the greater we are, the, the farther we are, so the farther we are from the star, the more that that star light is going to spread out. So the light is spread out over a larger and larger area. Therefore, its apparent brightness in lessons is less and less. We call this the inverse square law. So if you doubled the distance, you get the brightness of the star decreasing by a factor of four because the brightness is proportional to one over the distance squared. That's the inverse square law. So because of this, it's important to remember that a star will have an intrinsic amount of energy coming out of it, its luminosity. But if you put that star further and further away from you, its brightness is going to decrease by a factor of 1 over the distance squared. So that means the brightness that we appear to see in the night sky is really dependent on its intrinsic brightness, its luminosity, and how far away it is. We have to account for the distance. So let's practice this. Here's a concept question for you to consider. You have two stars, and they're both equally bright in the night sky. So you look up in the sky and you say, oh, these look equally bright. But you know that star A is 50 parsecs away, and star B is 100 parsecs away. So star B is twice as far away. Which star, therefore, has the greater luminosity, or therefore the greater apparent, or sorry, greater absolute brightness? Okay, hopefully you answered star B. Okay, so if both stars are appear to be the same brightness, but star A is closer and star B is further, it means that B has to be a lot more luminous to be just to look just as bright as A because it is twice as far away. So B has to have a greater intrinsic brightness, a greater luminosity. It has to have more energy coming out of it every second per square meter. Okay, so once we know the apparent brightness and the distance, we can then determine luminosity like you just did in that concept question. And it's really convenient to express luminosity in terms of the luminosity of our own sun. So you're going to start to see from now on, when we talk about properties of stars like luminosity, distance even, size, and mass, we're going to always compare it to the sun. So it'll be like luminosities of the sun. So maybe a star has two solar luminosities, meaning it's twice as luminous as our sun. So since we know how, if we know how far away a star is and we know how bright it appears to be, we know how bright it really is. It's true luminosity. And the way we measure how bright something appears to be in the night sky, and then therefore look at the distance to find the luminosity, we use the scale called apparent magnitude. So apparent magnitude measures 
apparent brightness. So notice that our sun is a negative 25 on apparent magnitude. Okay, so things that are really bright on apparent magnitude are more negative. But things that are really dim, like galaxies, are more positive on the apparent magnitude scale. Notice the bright star Sirius in our night sky is like a negative 1.4. But Pluto, a pretty dim planet, is a positive 15 on apparent brightness in terms of its apparent magnitude. So let's practice this. Which object appears brighter in the night sky? Star sparkle with a magnitude of point, positive 3.5 or star shine with a magnitude of minus 1.9. Okay, hopefully you answered star shine because it has a negative apparent magnitude, meaning its apparent brightness is brighter than star sparkle. Okay, so that's apparent brightness, but once we factor in the distance, we then can measure the star's true energy, the luminosity, which gives us the absolute magnitude. So it's the apparent magnitude a star would have if it were located at exactly 10 parsecs from Earth, seeing that if we put all the stars at the same distance, we'd be able to figure out the absolute magnitude. So in that case, if we know the apparent magnitude and the distance, we are able to figure out the absolute magnitude. Okay, so when you look up at the night sky, are you viewing apparent magnitude or absolute magnitude? Apparent! It's only how bright it appears to be. The absolute magnitude is how bright it actually is. The apparent magnitude depends on distance. Okay, so let's talk about temperature. So color depends on surface temperature. So we are able to determine a star's temperature by looking at its color. So red stars are going to appear cooler with a low surface temperature, and blue stars are hotter with a high surface temperature. So take a look at these different black body diagrams. On the left here, we have a cool star with a surface temperature around 3000 degrees Kelvin. And it emits much more red light than any blue light, so it appears red to us. And it's peaking in the infrared. If we look at a really hot star here on the right, with a surface temperature of about 10,000 degrees Kelvin, it emits much more blue light, okay, up here, than it does red light, so it appears blue. Now, warmer stars with surface temperatures akin to our sun, like 5,800 degrees Kelvin, they emit roughly equal amounts of all visible wavelengths, right, so this almost all visible, so it appears kind of a yellowish white to us. So, the important thing is, is that Blue stars are your hot stars, red stars are your cool stars, and that can help astronomers determine the temperature of stars. Now, in addition, we can look at the spectral classification of stars. So remember that the spectra tells us the chemical composition, and that the spectra tells the properties of a star. The color tells us the surface temperature. So stars have similar spectra, but a different pattern of absorption lines. So some stars have spectra with lots of Balmer absorption lines, or some have nearly absent Balmer lines, okay? So what astronomers did is they initially grouped stars with similar spectral classes. So in the 1890s, we, we classified stars based on their spectral class, whether they had a lot of Balmer absorption lines or few Balmer absorption lines. And so they categorized them from A to O, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on according to the strength or weakness of their hydrogen Balmer lines. But in the 1900s, astronomers reordered it, headed by a group of women scientists. They reordered the classification where spectral features change smoothly from one spectral class to another, not just the, the hydrogen Balmer lines. And this then got further divided from the subclass from numbers from 0 to 9. In the 1920s, it was found that temperature lines up with this new sequence. So it's reordered in this kind of weird fashion here, O-B-A-F-G-K-M. 
You can remember this classification.